Market manipulation sucks. Whether it's crypto pump and dumps or having a monopoly on the supply of goods, trying to control how the market works tends to favor a select few at the expense of many. But these can have a spiral effect in the markets being abused. One of the biggest dangers can be the breaking of trust, the loss of faith in the systems that we run our society on. There's been many examples throughout history of these kind of things happening. In US history, we saw the holes that existed in a system that works based on our trust in it and they very well could have led to the collapse of the markets they wish to profit off of, leading to price collapses, congressional intervention, and the Chicago River to be flooded with onions. So listen close, because we're going to uncover this story, peeling back layer by layer, as we learn something new. It was 1955, and onion farmer Vince Kasuga was coming up with an audacious plan that would allow him to get rich a plan that would lead him to becoming ruler over the onion industry in the United States. Born and raised in Pine Island, New York, Vince would find himself in possession of a 5,000 acre farm where he grew celery, lettuce, and of course, onions, with a wide array of customers, from the US Army to Campbell's Soup. But he also had his interest outside of producing food from the soil he worked. He took up trading wheat futures, which, after an unsuccessful string of bad trades, left him nearing bankruptcy. His wife begged him to just focus on farming full time, and he eventually agreed to give it up for her sake. But part of him could never let go. Part of him felt he could have made so much more trading futures. Years later, he would eventually get his shot to try again, but this time, he wasn't gonna leave it up to chance. To achieve this, however, he needed to manipulate the futures market. You see, futures contracts are made in an attempt by producers and suppliers of commodities to avoid market volatility and lock-in prices. A buyer and seller agree on a contract price for an item at a future date. Initially, futures were used for agricultural products, but now can also apply to financial products, shares, foreign currency, and interest rates. The buyer of the future product is said to be the long position holder, and the seller is said to be the short position holder. Kasuga wanted to control the price of onions by buying as many future onions as possible. So he partnered up with a futures trader in Chicago, Sam Siegel, and effectively entered into contracts with onion farmers to buy their onions. Soon, the two men had cornered the onion market. By the winter of 1955, onion futures contracts were the most traded product on the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. They accounted for 20% of all its trades. And the two men alone owned 98% of the available onions in Chicago. Kasuga had to build a warehouse to hold the 30 million pounds of onions he now owned. There were so many onions, it took 928 carloads to transport all the onions to Kasuga's farm in New York State. Now, with a monopoly over onions, Kasuga and Siegel could set the price, and they raised the price of onions to $2.75 a bag. At the same time, the duo began selling their onions on the futures market, taking a short position in order to lock in their profits. It was now time for part two of their plan. In March of 1956, Kasuga started the second part of his scheme, in which he would flood the Chicago market full of his onions. There were loading docks filled with 50 pound bags of onions and boxcars loaded with onions filled to the brim at every rail yard. Not content with having onions blocking all of Chicago transportation, Kasuga wanted to give the illusion that there was a never ending supply. To do this, he would ship out any old onions, wash and repack them, and then ship them back to Chicago. This gave the impression that there was a never ending supply of fresh onions arriving in the city all the time. Onions had invaded Chicago. The ridiculous oversupply of onions drove the price down to just 10 cents a bag. The mesh bag they were stored in cost 20 cents to produce, to put the price into perspective. All of the traders who had taken a long position, that is to say, agreed to buy onions from Kosuka at $2.75 a bag, had lost a ton of money. They were stuck with onions of no value whatsoever, and many of them ended up being dumped into the Chicago River. Kasuga, on the other hand, could not have been happier. His onion future scheme had made him eight and a half million dollars. That is roughly the equivalent of 87 million dollars in today's money. Many onion farmers across the country went bankrupt due to the scheme, and complaints were made to Congress. 
The Commodity Exchange Authority said Kosuga and Siegel had, quote, a conspiracy to depress the prices in order to cover their short position. Kosuga was unrepentant and believed he had done nothing wrong, saying, if it's against the law to make money, then I'm guilty. There was an investigation, and the U.S. Senate Committee on Agriculture and House Committee on Agriculture held hearings on the matter. Gerald Ford, future president but at the time U.S. congressman, sponsored a bill known as the Onion Futures Act, which would ban futures trading just on onions. It's the only agricultural product that is illegal to trade futures in. To this day, it makes it harder for onion farmers to plan their crops and lock in prices accurately. As for Kasuga, he returned to New York where he opened a restaurant next to his farm ironically called the Jolly Onion Inn, spending the rest of his days working as its chef. He also focused heavily on philanthropy, reinvesting much of his ill-gotten gains into his local community. Though, despite the Onion Futures Act going into effect to try and prevent anything like this from ever happening again, surprise, surprise, it happened again. Like in the 80s, when Yasuo Hamanaka, also known as Mr. Copper or Mr. 5%, tried to corner the copper market on a worldwide scale. The difference between his case and Kasuga's is that Hamanaka was attempting to operate outside the law, using loopholes to conceal his misdeeds. Before being revealed as the rogue trader who was ultimately responsible for 2.6 billion in losses for his trading company, Sumitomo, Hamanaka was widely admired for his copper market investment strategies, which made Sumitomo a world leader in copper, despite the fact that the company had no copper mines of its own. Ultimately, Hamanaka would be convicted of fraud and forgery and jailed for seven years, and while his company denied knowledge of Hamanaka's illegal trading activity, it would go on to pay out $150 million to settle claims with regulators. Hamanaka had been able to manipulate the copper market because he had acquired numerous futures contracts for Sumitomo, far above their significant holdings of physical copper. Because copper is an illiquid commodity, the 5% copper holdings of Sumitomo put them in a dominant worldwide position, essentially giving them the ability to control the world copper price through the London Metal Exchange. Hamanaka used his power to his advantage, relying on cash and maintenance of long positions in copper to force out investors who tried to short the commodity. While Hamanaka's market manipulations had been rumored among traders of the time, the London Metal Exchange was not required to report on positions, and so, data revealing Hamanaka's actual degree of control was not available to prove his activities. This all began to unravel after market conditions changed in 1995, and an increase in copper supply set the stage for a market correction. Sumitomo's long positions in copper at the time made for a significant liability to the company, but it wouldn't be until 1996 that Hamanaka's rogue trading would be revealed. But in the aftermath, regulations established by the London Metal Exchange have eliminated the possibility of a repeat of this kind of commodities market cornering. Though, around the same time Hamanaka was starting his plan, there was another scheme beginning to take effect on the other side of the world in America, which would lead to the collapse of the silver market. In the late 70s, the Hunt brothers, Nelson, William, and Lamar, tried to corner the silver market after inheriting a large fortune from their billionaire father, Haroldson Hunt Jr., who had made his fortune in the oil market. The three brothers were convinced that the value of the ever-increasingly popular fiat currencies would be severely eroded in the future, and they were eager to protect their purchasing power by buying large amounts of silver. Due in part to their large wealth and aggressive purchasing, the price of silver rose dramatically between 1979 and 1980, from just over $6 per ounce to over 40 In January of 1980, however, the price of silver declined by over 50% within less than a week partly due to new restrictions placed on speculative margin traders. The Hunt brothers, who despite their own fortunes were relying heavily on margin loans to fund their silver purchases, were faced with severe losses on their position. Soon, word began to spread that the brothers were starting to face margin calls from their brokers. Essentially, those who had loaned the brothers money were asking for it back, and the brothers didn't have it. As often happens in periods of financial crisis, rumor mixed with reality to cause investor sentiment to turn. Silver, which had only recently risen almost tenfold in the previous years, now seemed to be in a freefall. At their peak, the Hunt brothers had accumulated a staggering one-third of the entire global supply of privately owned silver. With its value rapidly declining, they soon became unable to honor the margin calls that they had been issued by their brokerage lenders. With bankruptcy seemingly imminent, the brothers received a bailout package of $1.1 billion. 
which was almost immediately followed by a formal investigation by the SEC. Ultimately, the Hunt brothers declared bankruptcy after being fined $134 million in relation to their attempts to corner the silver market. They were also banned from any future participation in the commodities markets. Some that sought to gain from manipulating the markets succeeded, and some failed. But whenever the attempt was made, people were hurt, people lost money, and some even lost their livelihoods. But if anything good was to come from this, each time it happened, it seemed like it was made a little bit harder for it to happen again. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, I would really appreciate it if you left a like below. And subscribe if you want to see more videos like this one. Thanks again, and I will see you next time.